Welcome to today's webinar, Travelling and Multiple Sclerosis. Your presenters are Sue Egan and John Beryl. My name is Annie Sasson and I'm your facilitator for today. We start all our webinars with an acknowledgement. So we acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians, past and present, on whose lands we meet today. We acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and the relationship of Aboriginal people to country and we respect the cultural authority of the elders in each community. I'll give you an introduction to the presenters today. So Sue is a senior member of the MS Connect team. The MS Connect is the intake and referral service for the MS organisation, providing information and advice and links uh, for other supports and services, both internally and externally. Sue has been in the role of the MS Connect Specialist for four years, but has been with the MS organisation since 2010 uh, in a variety of roles, including supporting the executive team, uh, supporting MS Readathon and the Community Visitor Scheme. Uh, our second presenter is John, and John is uh, an insurance and superannuation lawyer. He has worked with Morris Blackburn Lawyers for a number of years before starting up his own firm called Beryl and Watson. John has been a part of the Working with MS Education Program for over 20 years, <laughs> and he's proud of that. And has given and has given valuable advice to people with disabilities on legal issues, including travel and car insurance and RTA rules. Okay, I'll now hand over to Sue, who will commence the presentation for you. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, you're welcome, thank you. So I guess we'll just get straight into it. So the main things to consider when planning travel is to plan ahead and to be creative and to enjoy. So when we're talking about planning ahead, we're giving you lots of time to organise your travel to get everything in order. So you need to talk to your neurologist well in advance of your travel. And that's mainly in relation to any medications that you might need to take with you. So I think that's very important. So we would suggest that you take a letter with you that includes all the details about your MS, any conditions that you have, and medic medications that you will be travelling with you. Um, this can come from your neurologist or your GP. It's really important to keep copies of these letters both in your carry-on lugg luggage and um, your main suitcase. You might want to keep a PDF on your mobile phone as well. Uh, any medications that you take with you need to be in the original box and that's really helpful to have the pharmaceutical details on it that lists you as the person who's taken the medication. And you need to research storage for your medications and this is particularly important for people who are on injectables that may need to be um, refrigerated. So that's very important. So if you are carrying injectables with you, it's very important to inform the airline because you don't want to be on a plane and have your medication spoiled because they're not kept at the right temperature. Make sure that you can manage your luggage. So, you know, having the least amount of luggage possible is a really good thing. Um, consideration to your symptoms. So this is things like fatigue. Are you going to be able to manage to carry all your luggage? Um, suitcases, obviously, with wheels are fantastic. Um, maybe consider if you have a long haul flight to consider a stopover just to break up your journey. And if possible, take any equipment with you. Um, I think it's not very wise to rely on hiring equipment when you get to your destination, just in case it's not suitable. Also have a look at where you're going. So if you already have a disability parking permit, that might transfer um, to the country that you're going into. So that may just make things a little bit um, easier if you're going to visit somewhere like Buckingham Palace, for example. Um, you might like to be able to park closer because that's going to make your day more enjoyable if you're not fatigued with doing too much walking. Making copies of all your important documents, so we've talked about that already. Take telephone numbers of the Australian embassies and your local MS society of where you're going to go, just in case. Um, and when you read something about accessibility, don't assume that it is. And I do remember a, a story of a chap who was going up New South Wales with a, a, having a caravanning holiday, visiting properties and caravan parks that did say they were accessible. He was in a wheelchair and particularly with the main toilets um, in the caravan park he was staying, there was a, two steps dropped down into the um, bathroom facilities. So 
do make sure you do your research. If you're traveling interstate, again, take a copy of all your prescriptions with you. And this last point is taking cash um, in different currencies, which is probably a conversation to have with your travel agent as well. There are limits of the amount of money you can take into some countries, so definitely don't want to get in trouble with that one. The use of technology to your advantage. So take your mobile phone. It does say switch on to ro roaming, international roaming, but that can be expensive too. So have a conversation with your provider just to make sure that you're not going to have come home to a very big bill. Have some contact numbers on your phone, what to do in a crisis. And that might mean, you know, your neurologist's phone number, your GP's phone number, your health insurance, um, and also use it for reminders, medicine lists. If you want to list all of the current medications on your phone, that's probably not a bad idea. Um, and maybe learn to use um, your, your, your Siri on your mobile phone. Use the internet to plan ahead is another good idea. Asking for help. So we're talking about using the travel agents, telling them you've got special needs. Um, con consider using the special lounges at the airports. I did actually have a bit of a, a look at the Qantas Travel Club. It's about $500 to join and it's about $500 a year ongoing. So it's, it's, it's expensive. But if you do travel often, it might be worth considering. There are some concessions at some tourist venues. So worth if you have a companion card with you or a healthcare card, um, always worth asking the question. And this last point says ask, but don't expect. Um, so if I can interrupt for a second, <clears throat> pardon me. Philip has asked, um, he's currently stopped work due to his MS and he's been able to access um, his income protection. Um, as far as travelling overseas, will that income protection, can he utilise that for travelling overseas? I'll answer that. Okay. <laughs> okay, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. <laughs> Stay so, tuned, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Okay, so we've just listed some more resources here. Um, the Qantas travel card for domestic travel. Definitely, if you are travelling with Qantas, have a conversation with them to see what they do offer. The Multiple Sclerosis International Federation, MSIF, is a really good source of information. It does list all of the multiple sclerosis societies worldwide. MS Connect, where I'm working from. So if you wanted to have a conversation with one of our staff, we're 8.30 till 5, Monday to Friday. You can email us, you can do a web inquiry, we do live chat and you can telephone. We do have um, MS nurses here so we can have a conversation about travelling with medications. We have social work and OT advisors, peer support. Um, the MS photo ID card is valuable and this is something that we produce like every two weeks or so. There is an application form on our website and this is really handy because it does list on the back of it some common MS symptoms including um, that your signature may sometimes be inconsistent. Uh, it does have a, information in there about sometimes the person holding this card may have some mobility issues or difficulty with their balance. And that's really helpful too if you're in a bar, for example, and you're, a, you're um, not able to purchase alcohol because the bartender might suggest that you look a bit under the weather because you may be a bit wobbly. Um, and the other thing on here is the Go For Gold scholarships. So this is a program that we fund through the MS Mega Swim, and we have a number of scholarships uh, available on application. The applications open in March and they're awarded in August. And these do cover a variety of areas for having a dream. And travel is one of those um, fields. There's also education, there's learning and all sorts of things. So there is information on our website about the Go For Gold scholarships um, if you wanted to go and have a look at those. We've listed some websites on here and hopefully you've um, all had a look at the handouts. So as we said before, really worth exploring all of these um, websites just to see what they do offer. Um, and let me just have a look. Some of the cooling products that we've listed on there, if you're going to a hot country, you might consider taking um, a cooling vest with you, particularly with humidity. It's um, We all know that the heat isn't really a friend of MS. So do take the time to have a look at all of those and um, have fun exploring them. There's some extra reading there that I'm just gonna run through some of those. The first one's really valuable. This is produced by Eastern Health, so the MS Clinic at um, Box Hill Hospital, and that's got some really good tips 
um, as well. So very much would encourage all of you to open that PDF and have a read of that one. And the other two, the US National MS Society has got some things to consider as well. So that's um, a good resource as well. I haven't put, really explored all of these um, apps for your iPhone, but they're all listed there. Some clients have used them and they're worth exploring as well. So what are you waiting for? 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed on the things that you didn't do than the ones that you did. So throw away all of your cares and explore, dream and discover, which is a quote from Mark Twain. Well, I've come to the end of the slide, so um, I hope you found that helpful. I mean, the key points I want to say is it's really important to plan ahead. So all of the things that you need to consider, particularly important is travelling with the medications, and that's really important because we don't want you to get in, in any strife. The Smart Traveller website is the other one that I thought was really beneficial, and that does talk about travelling with medication and just ensuring that you're safe with going into a country where your drugs may be considered... Um, not known and we don't want you to get in any trouble going through customs so research and explore talk to your doctor talk to your neurologist talk to ms connect and i hope that's helpful okay great thank you sue um we'll just um ask you to swap seats now with john okay awesome and john will take over with um do you have any questions travel insurance and ms um, no, the questions that have come through seem to be for John. <laughs> so lucky John. Lucky me. Yeah. So where are we? So, all right, so that's your first slide there, John. So do you want to respond to the question first or we'll start on your slides? Um, I will very quickly go through the slides. Sure. Um, this is more of a sort of a general, hopefully interactive. So if you've got any questions, far away, and I'll answer them as we go. Okay. Um, there are also a couple of other things I want to cover, um, and such as you know, if you have problems with your travel agent, what do you do? Because um, there's a <coughs> there's a if there's a the travel agent association has a code of practice and it has a complaint scheme that you can go to if you're not happy with what your travel agent's done or if your travel agent goes belly up or whatever. Oh, okay. I'm actually on the code, what they call the code compliance committee of that. So we deal on this committee, we deal with complaints about travel agents. Um, and there's a couple of useful tips in that stuff. Yeah. Um, and then stuff <coughs> and stuff around, you know, visas that you need. It's just it, There was one in the in the last one we did in the, the last time we had a meeting on those, which was just a terror or real red flag to people who are travelling about um, what they should do or what they need to do. Um, anyway, look, um, perhaps we'll do with Philip's question first. So Philip's question was... Uh, okay, so Philip is about to... Um, <coughs> well, he thinks that he'll be stopping work soon and accessing his... Um, income protection. Income protection. Yep. And he wants to know: um, Is there a potential? Are there any potential re restrictions to travelling overseas when you're on income protection? Generally speaking, not. Um, under most insurance policies um, for income protection, which is the, usually pays your monthly payments if you can't work, if you can't do your normal job for the time being. Um, if you're on, uh, depending on the terms of the policy, then if you're unfit for work, you put in monthly progress report forms. Once you once you lodge your claim and your claim's accepted, then they put you on monthly pro progress report forms. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, if it's a long-term disability benefit, they put you on three monthly. Right. So every three, every one month or three months, you fill in a form in which you tell them what the progress of your condition is, and your doctor also fills in one as well. Right. So these these monthly or maybe three monthly progress report forms. Now, um, it's it's the exception, not the rule, that those uh, policies say that you must be in Australia for the whole time that you're there. I've never seen one that says you can't travel overseas, but a couple, I have seen a couple that say you can't be out of the country for more than 60 days. Now, that's a, that's an issue, for example, with Centrelink payments, um, but, not, but not so much with income protection. But the logistical problem you've got is if you're overseas for more than the period of this monthly form you've got to fill in, you've got to go to a doctor somewhere and get them to fill in their form. And depending on what country you're going to, that might be problematic. 
Okay, so what you'd, what you'd normally try to do, particularly if you've got a chronic illness such as MS, what you usually do is to um, ask the insurance company to put you on three monthly rather than monthly. So that if you're going overseas for a couple of months, I mean, most people go overseas for what? I think the length of time, I see all the stats in these of the Code Compliance Committee, um, the average time overseas is actually less than a month. But, you know, if you're overseas and it's going to straddle the period that you're putting in this claim form, then ask the insurance company to accept you for three monthly rather than one monthly. Don't necessarily tell them why, but do that, right? Because it will be a pain in the neck to try and get someone overseas, put your form in front of a doctor overseas and get them to sign it, all right, or complete it. But if you do, if you can't avoid that, then get in touch with the MS Society. They will have they can they will have a list of doctors. I assume, in, particularly in main countries, where you can go to for for help. Mm -hmm. And if and you, can, you guys can speak to me, and I'll sort something out. Sure. Okay. Sorry, I'll just go back to the original slide. <coughs> okay, yeah. original slide. Back to travel insurance. Right. Yeah. So, for most people, travel insurance. Back in the day, travel insurance just about all used to be purchased through a travel agent. Right. So what would happen is you go to the travel agent, that arrange your overseas trip, and then they'd shove this glossy fan fold out thing, which was the, the travel insurance brochure. Um, and they would say, here, so uh, you need this, take out this. Um, the there was a couple of problems with that. First of all, well, you know, they had a vested interest in who they were directing it towards because they were getting paid commissions on this stuff, and that still happens now. Um, it doesn't mean that necessarily that they're not the best travel insurer but you know there is this sort of tension financial tension there all right the second thing was the level of understanding of the travel agents about what's in the the fine print in these travel insurance fold out brochures and there's heaps of fine print in it um, was very variable right so a lot of travel agents knew bugger all about the fine print and so for example Questions like, well, look, and I've got a pre-existing condition, MS or something else. Um, what's this mean if I go overseas and I get crook? What happens? You know, um, and you know, what's the level of a cover I got? Have I got um, have I got capped um, cover for medical, hospital, etc., um, or is it you know um, uncapped? So, <clears throat> quite often, what you, we so as a lawyer, I used to see quite a few people had complaints about the way these policies were sold or interpreted to them by travel agents. But of course, there's been a big shift with the introduction of the web. Uh, a big shift is that a significant proportion of people who travel overseas now get their insurance, or now get their, arrange their travel themselves online um, and not through travel agents, right? And if they arrange their travel online, they also arrange their travel insurance online. And if you're, or for example, if you've got uh, a Commonwealth Bank gold card, or um, then you get travel insurance as part of that. Um, my son's actually just taken out ING, signed up to an ING bank, and he gets travel insurance as part of that. So there are the, the traditional, what are they called, pathways by which you would get travel insurance have changed over the years. So all funneled previously through travel agents now diversified right but um, so the difference is that now if you buy travel insurance online you'll still uh, you'll find attached to the the forms about it um, a, th a document called a product disclosure statement or a PDS which is about a 20 pager um, which has got all the fine print all the details about what you're covered for and what you're not covered for and that's all online now rather than in this glossy fan fold out thing -o that the travel agent used to give you, now you've got it online. You've got to scroll through that to find mm. out what you're covered from, what you're not. Isn't it right? reasonable to expect or assume that people are going to read a 20 page? Absolutely PDF? not. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> yeah. you know? Nobody does it, right? So um, one thing that always annoys me is someone who's, I'm a consumer lawyer, you used to see all these, you see these articles in the paper saying, oh, from consumer advocates and whatever, saying, oh, you know, you've got to read the fine print stuff. Well, it's just nonsense. People don't read the fine print. I mean, I've got a home and contents insurance policy. It's only nerds like me that read this stuff. <laughs> I bet you none of you guys have sat down and read your home and contents insurance well, you policy. you have to understand it too. I mean, that's the other well, thing. That's right. May scroll through the first three pages and then just go. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
all I would say to you, or what, what I say to people is there's just a couple of things you need to look for, right? Um, so, <clears throat> so as that last line says there, people don't look at the fine print. So I, I, there's a couple of key things I want you to look at, which is the next page. That one, right. Okay, so there's two types of cover in travel insurance policies. There's non-medical, which is if you get robbed, <clears throat> um, if you lose your baggage bags from the carousel, um, if you um, miss your flights, um, that sort of stuff, um, or you know, cruise the cruise ship, or well, there was a cruise ship the other day that was um, had to pull back into port because there was a big blue, yes. a big, a massive blue that. on port, so they had to pull back into the shore. <laughs> so all these, all those conditions, they're all not what we would call non-medical, right? So your MS is not relevant to that. So there should be no problem getting cover or claiming. On those sorts of problems now there are a couple of things to look out for though particularly you see as, as someone who works in the area of um, insurance disputes um, loss of bags from the carousel is always a big thing right mm -hmm. so and, and what it what the policies always say is you must you the, the bags must be in your control or you must keep an eye out for them so you, you can't just sort of I don't know go off and get yourself a coffee waiting for the Bag, so your bag goes around the carousel ten times, and then someone else racks off with it. Then you might have a problem with the uh, insurance company paying you up. All right, but <clears throat> anyway, look, your MS itself is not a bar, not a barrier to getting cover for the non-medical. Okay, um, medical cover is a different ball game though, and the medical cover is primarily the, the biggest biggest ticket item is hospital. Right, so if you if you go overseas and you get hospitalised for whatever health problem, or if you need to go to a doctor overseas, or if you need to be sort of medivaced back to Australia, then this is where the health the health issue that you're claiming for, <clears throat> or that you're hospitalised for, that you're medivaced back to Australia for, comes into play. And the medivac stuff is actually quite common, uh, and it's common because travel insurance companies, if they're on the hook for you, they want to get you out of that hospital in um i don't know zimbabwe okay, yeah. or wherever <laughs> or Reykjavik, which is where i'm going in may oh. um they want to get you out of that hospital and they want to get you on a plane and back to australia because as soon as you hit australia you're not their problem right you're the australian health systems problem so they will be desperate to try and get you out of that all right so medivac is a is a, is a significant issue but <clears throat> travel insurance for many <coughs> for medical cover Big issue is you, you don't want any caps on the cover. So, for example, if you go to a country like the USA, where you know the where all the horror stories you you hear of are dead right. I mean, I've seen some horror, massive horror stories of people who get. I have one guy who was, who was in hospital for he was in hospital for six days. He needed it wasn't a it wasn't an um, MS related condition. It was a it was a he he had a blood condition and he needed a transfusion. And uh, he was in hospital for like six days, and the bill was over a hundred thousand US. You know, it's just mm. crazy stuff over there. So mm. you you must get no limits on your cover, right? That's really important. Um, uh, okay, so um, the medical cover is the key thing you need to look for. Um, now. Most travel insurance, there's two types of medical cover, of course, and that's for injuries or sicknesses that you develop overseas when you're on your trip, or injuries and sicknesses that predate, right? And under under just about all travel insurance policies, they call them PECs, pre-existing conditions. So what you'll find buried away in the fine print on page 17 of the glossy is a definition, and it says pre-existing condition, and that's the thing that's relevant to you. If you've got it, if you've got a pre-existing condition such as MS, so if you cut, if you have any injuries or sicknesses overseas that are not related to your MS, no problems, right? No problems. So if you, you know, if you're walking down the streets of Rome on those cobblestones and you go belly up, um, well, I suppose it could be there could be an argument say, well, that was because you had you're a bit wonky on your pegs because of your MS, but if not, and it's then, um, or if you're hit by a car or something like that, then that, there's no problem with that. Or if you get an infection while you're overseas for something, again, not related to your MS, no problem. You'll be covered under the terms of your policy, solving your policies current at the time. 
Um, a couple of questions <coughs> there, John. Far away. Um, uh, Lorraine has said that she has a gold card and she's yes. asked for, she wants to use the complimentary insurance. That's the C Commonwealth Bank gold card, yep. 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 Um, for some previous travel, and she inquired about getting coverage for her pre-existing condition, yes. i.e. MS. Yes. Um, she was quoted $45. <clears throat> Is that enough? It's not bad. It's not bad. Okay. Right? Okay. So okay. does she feel that she's got full coverage if she pays an extra $45 on top of the bill? Yeah, well, what it is, so what it is is that when you take out um, travel insurance, you just fill in the form, right? Now, you're not asked on that. Name any pre-existing conditions you've got. They 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 give you the cover under the terms of the policy. Well, but with but with an exclusion for pre-existing conditions. That's sort of the what we would call the default position, right? So so if you've got this pre-existing condition such as MS, which means basically that you've got a pre-existing condition that you've had treatment for in the last X period of time. It's usually up to fifty-two weeks. Could be could be four weeks, could be uh, two months, it could be 52 weeks. But most people with MS are on some sort of medication um, or getting some sort of treatment. So if you're in that boat, pre-existing condition, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're if the reason for your claim when you're overseas, if you only take out the default cover, which is the just filling in the form, normal form, and not disclosing your MS, you won't be covered for a pre that pre-existing condition. If you're not under active treatment. Um, you might not get, you might not be caught by that clause, but just about every pre, every travel insurance policy now includes, or has for a number of years now, include included sort of a catch-all, which is okay. Even if you're not under active medical treatment, but you've got a uh, a condition, a chronic condition, then you're not covered anyway. Or well, sorry, you're not covered for the pre-existing condition under the default cover, right? But what the what the questioner is asking is. How do you then get cover for your MS? And the answer is you can, and you do that by filling in all the, the travel insurance forms have got um, uh, a separate form you fill in. If you want to get cover for your pre-existing condition, your MS, there's a form you fill in in which you disclose your MS, you tell them what your the, the nature of your condition is, how it affects you, and you get and you get a usually get and the, the idea would we get a certificate from your doctor, preferably your, your neuro, your neurologist, saying that yes, you've got MS, but it's not affecting you to the extent that you would be an adverse risk of getting crook overseas. Okay, so if you get that, fill in that form, plus get a certificate from your doctor, preferably your neurologist, saying that you're not a an at, you're not a special risk of getting crook overseas. Put that into the insurance company, and they will make a decision about whether they will cover you not only for injuries or sicknesses that occur overseas but also your pre-existing condition. Now what the um, questioner has experienced Lorraine, is that, yeah. Lorraine's experienced is that the insurance, she's gone through that process and the insurance company says yeah we'll give you cover but we're going to charge you a lo what we call a, a loading, right, a pre an extra premium for it. 45 bucks is sounds okay, right, okay. if that gets her the full cover, Lorraine, so long, so long as that gets you the full cover um, including for the MS then as a general rule, that would be okay. It's standard sort of stuff, right? Some people, for some people, they can't get cover for their pre-existing condition. But you know, it does vary. It varies from insurer to insurer, and it it's basically on a case case by case basis. The insurer will look at the nature and extent of your MS. So MS is not an absolute barrier to getting this cover, but um, you know, it, they'll look at how your MS is affecting you. Okay. Next question. Great, thank you, John. Uh, Birgit has asked, um, uh, will my insurance cover uh, damage to walking aids, wheelchairs, etc.? Does it extend to? Yes. Yes, it can. Um, it, so if you get, if you've got walking, if you've got other materials, right, and they get damaged overseas, then yes, they will be they will be covered as a general rule. You got to look at the you got to look at the terms and conditions. So some insurance policies will cover, will limit the cover you can get for baggage. Some of it, uh, for example, with particular items such as valuables, there's caps on them, like you know watches. It might be a thousand bucks, or mobile phones it might be five hundred bucks. So generally speaking, you can get cover for those things. Now, if you can, uh, the question is, can you get cover for other incidentals such as walking aids, etc.? You'd have to apply for the cover. I think you'd have to apply for the cover 
to make sure you get the cover for it. And then they make a decision on a case by case basis, but put it up. Yeah. But don't don't not disclose it to them. Disclose it to them and say, can I get cover for that? Yeah. yeah. All, right? Okay. All right. Always Fantastic. important stuff. Another um, one? Yeah, Philip has asked, is there a list of insurers who may be, um, I suppose, sympathetic towards MS clients <coughs> um, or people with MS? Yep. Um, is there a list of uh, known ones that we could? We do. At yeah. MS Connect, we've got a document and we don't necessarily endorse any of them, but we have over the you know, course of time heard that some people have gone to this company and they've got a good deal. Hmm. So at MS Connect, we do have a list that we can email to oh, people, okay. but it's also make your own inquiries. What's sure. Sue said? Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. So if you heard that, Philip, um, if it, you can call MS Connect. It, it is a bit of a movable feast, though. Oh. Things do change, yes, right? Yes, of course. Um, now, the, the funny thing is that um, there's all these brands of travel insurance products out there, but they actually funnel back to about half a dozen insurers, right? So um, uh, Suncorp, for instance, have got about half a dozen brands, mm. right? So you'll, there's there's Covermore, there's uh, um, World Assist, mm. there's all sorts of insurance products or travel insurance products out there. But you look at the underwriter in the fine print and it actually funnels back to only about half a dozen insurers. Right, yeah. All right, so got any, any okay, more questions? No, Are we on? Yep. Keep going. Da, 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 da. Oh, medical cover, applying for cover. Well, that's what we just dealt with. That was Lorraine's question. Mm -hmm. So, as I say, the, the default product will be you'll be excluded for your pre-existing condition. Right? So you'll get cover for non-medical. You'll also get cover for medical that's not that occurs whilst you're overseas and that is not related to a pre-existing condition. But your pre-existing condition, such as MS, will almost certainly be knocked out if you just get the default cover. If you want to get the cover for any MS related condition, you've got to make this application for MS cover. And as I say, you, there's a form to fill in and get a certificate from your, preferably a neurologist saying that you're not, yes, you've got MS, but it's under control, it's manageable, and you're not an adverse risk of getting crook whilst you're, what you do. Always apply at least a couple of months before you're due to, due to travel. Now that's a problem because all the stats show that people are now making decisions about travel and traveling really quickly but you've got to sort of plan ahead a bit I mean with when you've got a chronic condition as Sue is telling you planning ahead is the mm, important thing so key. the same applies to the travel insurance plan ahead give it a couple of months for them to if you're applying for the cover to get get the insurer to make a decision in that time okay medical cl cover claims we got any more questions or are we no barreling on yep. okay medical cover claim so if you need to make a claim right so if you get crook overseas whether it's from because of ms or it's anything else there's a process now you'll always get a little card that's got a an emergency number on it you the travel agent will give it to you as part of the package you get or if you do it online there will be there'll be a separate box so print that off and take that put it in your documents to take with you so make sure you got it there or someone's got it um, <clears throat> and then if you get crook and you're in hospital then you contact the emergency number um, and then you do it over the phone you tell them what happened and then they sort of spring into action and they look they are pretty good um, I've got to say most travel insurers are pretty good the reason why they're pretty good is because travel insurance is ridiculously expensive for the benefits they provide there's, if you if you if you ever wanted to do this stuff, there is a there's a website under the, one of the government regulators called APRA. They've got this website that you've got to bury around to find it, but it talks about the um, the lot what they call what we call the what we in the game call the loss ratios of different types of insurance, mm -hmm. right? And the loss ratio means for every premium dollar that's paid, how much does the insurer return in claims? And one of the lowest return rates is travel insurance right. and the reason for that is because mm -hmm. it's so it's so ridiculously highly priced right it's a, it's it's not exactly a super competitive market the price is highest it's about so, last i saw was about 45 cents in the dollars returns quite low because of that in, you know insurance companies if you're if you're a cynic a bit like me only to some extent, but um, <laughs> travel. Some travel insurers, yeah, insurance companies work on on a numbers game, right? And to some extent, the the extent to which they play hardball depends on how they're going on their claims experience. Now, the claims experience traditionally with travel insurance is low because they make money out of it, so they they 
tend not to play hardball with you, right? But if you've got a pre-existing condition, you don't have cover for your MS, then um, these sort of the, the question it will be a live question of the insurer. Well, is this thing that you're now claiming for related to your MS? That will be a live issue, right? Um, if you go to there are ways around this, of course. If you if you go to a country that Australia's got reciprocal um, Medicare arrangements with, and there's a there's a list of about twelve of them. I think there's, they're not that many. Yeah. Um, then um, you can go to you know hospital department and you'll be treated there. Like the UK is yeah. one. Yep. The, the list, yeah, the list is quite it's quite small, but it's quite quirky. Some of them you go, oh really? We've got a reciprocal arrangement with them, but the big one is we don't have a reciprocal arrangement with the United States of America. Yeah, they're the biggest. Yeah. As far as health costs. <clears throat> yeah. So. Um, all right, so anyway, the claims process, so usually it's done by phone um, and then they will make a decision about, they usually make a decision up front about whether they'll cover you or not, right? They then might get someone to follow you up and there might be a claim form come as part of that process that you'll have to fill in. Um, but usually if, you know, if there's an issue about, you know, emergency treatment or, you know, medivacking you back to Australia, they make those decisions pretty quick, as I say, because they don't want to, Keep paying your bills, but but so once rather, you come back into the country, then their obligations ceases. Done. So then okay. it's like Medicare or your own private health insurance Correct. That takes over. Correct. Yep. So that's why they get you on a plane. They'll 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 pull out a couple of seats and push you put or put you in first class mm -hmm. or whatever. They'll pay the ten grand or fifteen grand. You know, hospitals are however much a, a day. You know, mm -hmm. so that's why they they're they're into that stuff. Anyway, if you if you go through the claims process under there's a a code of practice that governs these insurance. This insurance is called general insurance as opposed to life insurance. So under the code of practice, an insurer must make a decision within four months. There are some exceptions to that. If they don't make a decision or if they reject your claim, there's a there's a complaints process you can go through, which is the net, that slide there, right? So if you lodge a complaint, they have 45 days in which to make a decision on the complaint. Your complaint gets elevated up the food chain to a complaints officer. They make a decision. If they don't make a decision, or if they, or if it's a no, then you've got the right to lodge a complaint to an ombudsman, which is that mob down the bottom, FOSS. Although that's about to change <clears throat> because the government has introduced a change to amalgamate some of these ombudsman schemes together, and FOSS is going to change its name. But it's it's not going to make any difference. That there still will be that appeals process you can go through. All right. Now you will. If the decision is we're not going to pay you because your condition is related to your MS um, and you don't have cover for MS or your cover is limited or whatever, then you need to look at things such as getting medical reports to say no, no, this is not related to my MS. So say if you fall over on the street and the insurance company says, well, that was because of your MS, and you say no, it wasn't, and your doc, you get medical evidence or other evidence to put together. That's what you sort of. That's what you're looking at. You've got to nail down what the issue is, and then deal with it that way. All right, but it's a good well, idea to get help. It's difficult. With it. I mean, particularly with the cobblestone sort of scenario. <laughs> yeah. Somebody with MS might have um, might fall over purely because their balance is lousy, but anybody in the normal population Maybe they also have yeah. a struggle with. I've done it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. So when you say getting evidence, so obviously a doctor's note or certificate to say that, you know, generally your balance is okay. Yeah. What about eyewitnesses and yeah, all that kind of stuff? Exactly. Or photographs of the area that you Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Photographs. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Or if you um like we went to see our son in uh, <clears throat> in Jakarta a while ago. Uh, a couple of years ago, and the footpaths there, they've just got dirty big <laughs> holes in them. Yeah. So you're sort of jumping over holes in them. It's, you know, anybody could. It's like a jungle, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I recently came back from India and they've got like the footpath and then an open hole to the drain under the road. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's so, so unsafe. Yeah, yeah. 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 So mm. that's, what, that's where the planning that you're talking about comes into, yes. into play. All right, so where we got now? Resources. Oh, there's, there's your resources stuff. Now, let me talk about a couple of other things. Yes, right? please do. We've got um, plenty of time. So, uh, as I said, there is, um, if you do get your, arrange your travel through a travel agent, um, there are, you know, most people's travel agents are great. I mean, this is, I deal with um, area where things go wrong, 
that's that's my role as a lawyer. Um, <clears throat> so I've seen many cases where people have been unhappy with conduct or decisions of their travel agents or what the travel agents arrange for them. If you, if you're not happy with the, what the travel agents done, then there is there is a complaints mechanism you can go through. You can lodge a complaint. You can ask them. You can tell. First of all, you're going to go back to them and say, "Look, I'm not happy, and this is why," and put it in writing to them. If you're not happy, then if you're not happy with the outcome they put they put to you, then then you can go to a thing called the it's called the ACCMC, which don't worry about that. But um, <laughs> it's a complaints body, right? That deals with complaints against travel agents, uh, and you can get an a, a, a remedy out of that. Okay, so and I say I'm I'm one of the consumer reps on the on that on the panel, the Code Compliance Committee in that. So we deal with complaints people lodge against travel agents. Now, not everybody goes to a travel agent and only about two thirds of travel agents are covered by the Code of Conduct. But the main ones are, you know, if you go through, the main travel agencies are, are under it. Uh, you know, Escape Travel, you know, Flight Centre, Flight Center, all of them. They're all, they're all part of the, they're all covered by this code and the code compliance committee. So you know they they make undertakings to put things in plain writing to you, all that sort of stuff, and you know and follow through on what your options are. So I mean, there are the sort of issues that if you've got balance issues or walking issues. So things like um, you know how far if if you put part of a tour, if they put you on a tour, but the tour requires too much walking or something like that, or the distance between the train. And the drop-off or the pick-up point is too far, and it doesn't accommodate your disability. Then those are, they're the sorts of things that we see at the code compliance committee. So, look, hopefully none of this ha comes about. Look, uh, and with most complaints, it's about communication. You just got to communicate communicate clearly to your travel agent what your limitations are. Tell them this is what this is what I want. This is what I need to accommodate my disability, um, just make sure this fits in with it, right? But things can go wrong. And if they do go wrong, just keep that in your back pocket that there is there is a mechanism you can go through if you're unhappy the with that. Is it always a good outcome for the consumer through the ombudsman? No, process? not always. So I wish it was. What kind of... Consumer app. I wish it was. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's not. What kind of um, claims are knocked back or what kind of incidents would be deemed... Oh, uh, if yeah, if the travel agent has actually done the right thing, and if the person's expectations were over and above what the travel agent contracted for, what they what what they done, what what you had agreed to at the start, some people's expectations of the of what that agreement is are different from what sort of the documents show. All right, so it's, that's why I say it's really important to say to them, look, this is I've got MS. This, this is this is what it, this means to me. Um, so this is the sort of thing I need with the, the, the with the tour you arrange. So it's, I mean, travel agents don't only not, don't only arrange your flights. They arrange, you know, the, the bus trip. They arrange the transfers. They arrange the, the boat trips. That sort of stuff. So that's why it's really important to put forward and say, you know, well, what is available. <coughs> um, one tip that I think is really great is take a walking stick with you, and even if you don't normally use it, if you're out and about on a tour and you have a stick with you, people seem to give you some space. I so see you're coming and they get out of your way a little bit more. So, you know, even if you don't normally Otherwise use a walking stick. Otherwise you beat them over the head with them. Well, yes, you can do that too. But that's just really helpful too. And it's just a, a visual awareness because we all know a lot of um, people with MS have invisible symptoms. So um, I guess having a walking stick says, you know, I may have some trouble walking. Get out of my way. Leave me some yeah. space. Yeah. Um, I just think that's a good useful tip. Yeah. Let me give you another another tip. Um, sure. Two other tips actually. One really important thing these days, and I've, we've seen a number of these at the at the uh, <coughs> Code Compliance Committee with the, the Travel Agents Association, is visas, right? Temporary visas. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go into the States, for example, there's a temporary visa called an ETSA. ETSA? I think it's ETSA, yeah. So you've got to get a temporary visa if you go into the States. Mm -hmm. But there are a number of other, so, but, and most travel agents will be all over you saying, right, you need an ETSA visa. But you can get it online, it's easy to do. But you've got to have it. If you don't have it, you can't get on the plane. They won't. Okay. You will not be going to the states. Or if you arrive without one, they'll sh they'll send you straight back. Mm -hmm. But there are other couple of other countries that have gotten. Like one of them is Canada, and um, you know you can get bizarre sort of scenarios. Like um, I, we we saw one. I saw one recently where what happened was that this couple were flying from Europe to the states, 
and they were having a transit stop in uh, somewhere in Canada. It was a city in Canada on the way there, right? Um, and um, much as it was a transit stop, which means you're not staying in Canada you're not the airport. Mm. and you're not leaving the airport, but nevertheless, you actually go through customs in Canada. Mm. And because you go through customs, you need you needed a um, a visa, right? So even so, it was this this couple they had no idea about this, and you'll get with some even even if it's not with through a travel agent, you'll get general warnings saying, "Oh, you got to make sure your visas are in place." But it really is important um, because what happened in this couple's case was they weren't allowed on the plane in uh, in Europe mm. to go to Canada to the states via Canada, mm. and they then madly applied online when they were at the airport to, to get this visa and they got it, but it was too late. The plane had gone and yeah. they had to go and buy a ticket for another plane and it cost them significant dose. Oh, I've heard similar horror stories about people travelling to Asia <coughs> who have had less than three months on their passport yes. to expire. Oh. Yes. That's another thing that really is really important. And then you may yeah. have four months on there, but then if you get delayed because you're unwell or you travel, you might yeah. end up having an expired passport. Yeah. So. Yeah. Really important to have important a good stuff. Um, amount of time left on your passport. So, if you're going through a travel agent, the travel agent will be usually all over those, um, and they will tell you this stuff. Yeah. But my, even even if you are going through a travel agent, don't take it as gospel. Check it yourself, mm -hmm. right? But if you're not going through a travel agent, this stuff's really important yeah. right? because it can make the difference between you being allowed on a plane or not, or being stuck in some transit lounge yeah, with nowhere to go. Really yeah. One other thing. One other thing I was find is that and this is just a little tidbit is that um when you arrive in a country and you're filling in the you know the, the form to, to the customs form they always ask you where are you staying you've always got to have some place and you can't you, you've always got to have an address mm -hmm. right and if you don't have an address <laughs> they won't let you through yeah, yeah. so <clears throat> you even if you don't know where you're staying if you have a connection or a somebody you know yeah you, you know offer their address Oh, it's, it's always it's always important to have you know your first night's accommodation mm. sorted, sorted before yeah. you go, and then one other thing is um, uh, what happens. See if you if you book through a travel agent or if you book through a scam website, what turns out to be a website that's a scam. Um, if if you book through a travel agent, um, you will pay the travel agent the money for the for the travel. Right, the travel agent then holds that money and then they. Then they arrange the tickets, etc., and they pay it. But there's there's usually a gap. There's a there's a gap between when you pay them the money, and when the ticket when the tickets are actually booked, etc. Right now, that that money is not kept in a trust account. That money is kept by the the travel agent. Now, um, what used to be the case was if the travel agent then went bust, for example, or if you booked it online yourself, and there was a it was a scam, then you're out of pocket. Right, you can be out of pocket now. If it was done through a travel agent, it used to be the case that there was a thing called the travel compensation fund that would compensate you for your loss up to a certain amount. With the new, with the scheme that's in place now, with the code compliance committee, there's no such, oh, okay. there's no such compensation. So if you, if your travel agent goes bust, or if you, um, or if you book it online yourself and it turns out to be a scam, then you've blown your dough. But if you do it through a, your credit card. Then there's credit chargeback, right? So you can usually then reclaim that money. So yep. and it, you've, but there's usually a limited time to do it. It's usually, I think it's about sixty. I think it's sixty days, right? So there's this thing called if that's if you do it through a credit card. Now, more and more people these days are trying to avoid credit card fees, so they're they're doing it by debit card or doing it sort of through a cash transaction where they don't pay these credit card fees. But one thing to keep in mind in balancing that up is that the credit card fees do, uh, you've got this credit chargeback arrangement under most of these where you can recover. It's a bit like insurance without having insurance, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 And also you get frequent flyer points or some kind of points. <laughs> <laughs> loyalty programs. <laughs> yeah. So they're sort of general stuff. I hope okay. we've covered off any more questions we got um no questions but david's just asked about the recording and the recording will be available and i'll put it on to the website uh within a week or so so that'll be available for everyone so well sorry i've just got maybe i should just sure. say a couple of other things um yep. one is and this is related to what philip said before if you travel overseas and do it 
it's such fun, isn't it? Um, <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. You would never come back and say, I wish I'd never done that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I've lost my train of thought. What was I going to say? Um, about Philip. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. It, it, so as Philip's uh, case highlighted, if you if you're on if you've got some sort of income arrangement or you're getting income whilst you're overseas, um, now whether that's through insurance arrangements such as income protection or workers comp or TAC or whatever, or if it's through if you've got Centrelink benefits, if you're on Centrelink benefits, there is a live question as Philip has raised as to whether your that income stream is affected for the period of time you're overseas. As, as explained to Philip before, under most insurance policies, your income protection payments are not affected, are not stopped or suspended whilst you're overseas, but you've got usually got the logistical issue of getting the progress report forms completed by doctors overseas, right? That's the first thing. The second thing is Centrelink payments, right? Mm. If you're on if you're on Centrelink payments, the cutoff is usually a month, right? If you're if you're going overseas for more than a limited period of time, then your Centrelink payments may be suspended or stopped. Mm. Now, um, one of the significance of those is if you're on a disability support pension, um, as some as some some listeners may be. Um, one thing that's really important here is that DSPs are pretty hard to get these days, right? So the, the if you've been on a DSP for some period of time, then if your DSP is stopped whilst you're overseas, if you apply for it again, then you know you'll be it caught on. Might not be so easy to get it back. Might not be so easy to get yeah. it back. And so what what we often say to people because I'm involved in the um, uh, <clears throat> a mob called the Social Security Rights Victoria, which gives people advice about Centrelink issues. What we often say to people is if you are going overseas, if you're on a DSP and you're going overseas for more than the sort of the minimum period of 31 days, then ask Centrelink to, you can apply to Centrelink to get permission to, to go for a longer period. But do keep in mind, if you do that, your file gets on someone's desk. And if you're on a DSP, it is possible for Centrelink to review whether you still satisfy the current requirements for a DSP, which are pretty steep. So if you're on a, whereas you know, if you've been a long-term DSP, you might have got on a DSP under the old, more generous yeah. rules, mm. but if your payments get stopped or if they review you, then you might be subject to the new arrangements. So always get advice on that stuff. Now, you can get advice through the MS Society. Um, I, I work with uh, Social Security Rights Victoria, which gives advice on Centrelink issues. I know all about income protection. I know all about travel insurance. I know all about superannuation. So if you've got any questions anytime, give us a call or contact these guys and um, we'll sort it out for you. It doesn't cost anything. Yes, free of charge. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, John. Um, if there's any more questions, please um, type them through now. Um, and while we're doing that, I'll just step through some NDIS um, information. Yeah. Um, thank you, John. Okay, so on your screen there, you'll see that there's a couple of um, resources that um, you may be interested in reading. Um, if you can't get a hold of them either through print or ebook, uh, perhaps if you call MS Connect and we'll be able to um, let you know where Respond. to get them from. Mm. Respond is the right word. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, as I said, if you have questions, please let us know. Um, uh, if there are any questions that aren't responded to today, please call MS Connect on 1800 042 138 or email us on msconnect at ms.org.au. And I noticed, John, you called us the MS Society, and we used to be called that many That's years true. ago. Yeah. We are now called My just bad. simply MS or Multiple Sclerosis Limited, um, but MS Connect is the first port of call. Yes. Yeah. All right. No worries. Thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> You're forgiven. <laughs> okay. Um, just a word on the um, NDIS. Um, as many of you may know, it's a major change to the way disability supports and services are funded and delivered. Um, it affects the availability. Sorry, if you're under, uh, to be available for it, you need to be under 65 years of age, um, satisfy residency requirements and demonstrate that your disability substantially affects your daily life. Um, the scheme promotes choice, control and social and economic participation. It provides a whole life approach, um, whole of life approach. Um, it is not means tested. It uh, provides reasonable and necessary supports and services 
and it ensures equity of access. Um, here at MS, we can help you understand the eligibility requirements and the pathways to access the NDIS. Uh, we can help you um, prepare for your planning conversation. Um, we can help you understand your current supports and if you have any unmet needs, we can also assist there. Um, and we can also help you to develop your goals for the future. Uh, the MS organisation is registered with the NDIS um, as a provider and we provide several um, supports and services and they're all listed there on the screen. If there is anything that you're um, uh, needing or wanting assistance with, we also provide support coordination and connection. So we have a, an NDIS team here who are ready and willing and able to assist you um, to discuss your plan or to get your plan underway uh, or in acting your plan. Um, so the number there is uh, the MS Connect number. Okay, so thank you very much everyone for attending today. I hope that you found it um, useful. I know that I got a fair bit of information from John. Thank you very much, John. I'll take a bit of that on board. And thank you to Sue for your um, input as well. Um, now, at the end of the webinar, before we close off, um, your screen will come up with a, um, a short survey. If you can please uh, give us your feedback on today's webinar, it will be very much appreciated. Okay, um, I'll just check and see if there's any more questions that have come through. Um, a fair few people saying thank you very much for the webinar. Um, uh, Birgit is asking, what about travel for people with significant disabilities or people residing in a nursing home? I'm assuming someone in a nursing home would not be travelling so much. Um, I can't. Well, it's just things to consider. So do you need to, to pay a carer to go with you? And the key is really in the planning. I mean, people who are in wheelchairs do travel a lot, but it may be difficult with accessing the toilet on an aeroplane. Um, so it's really about doing your research. It's really yeah. important to talk to the airline, talk to your carers, and just look at, you know, what do you need in a normal day and how restricted are you going to be on a very small plane? Um, and there is considerations about... Um, you know, when you get to the airport, generally you check in your own equipment and then they put you in their equipment. Um, it's, yeah, a lot of things to consider. So really mm -hmm. important to do your, your research. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I hope that's um, answered that sufficiently for you. Um, okay, it uh, doesn't look like there's any more questions come through. So once again, thank you everyone for attending today. And um, any questions, please feel free to call MS Connect on 1800 uh, 042 138. All right, have a lovely day. Thanks very much for attending. Bye for now.